Welcome to Marine Tech Talk, a podcast about how Teledyne Marine's innovative technologies are enabling scientific discoveries and commercial tasks in the world's oceans and waterways. In this episode of Marine Tech Talk, we talk with two hydrographic surveyors in Denmark from the Danish Geodata Agency. Listen in as they talk about using the Teledyne Reason Seabat multi-beam sonar, the sonar of choice for all their hydrographic surveys. They have a long history with the Seabat sonar system and often come across some unexpected or unusual targets. In this episode, hear about two of those anomalies and the stories behind them. Now, here is the host of Marine Tech Talk, Rhonda Moniz. And welcome everyone to Marine Tech Talk, the Teledyne podcast for all of those people out there that are in the industry doing all these really cool projects. I happen to have two gentlemen um, in Denmark, correct? Yes. So they're, I'm a little early this morning. You guys are ahead of me. Um, and we are chatting about the Seabat, the Teledyne Seabat, and some uses and, and projects that these guys have done, which is actually really some cool stuff here. And um, so I want to get right into it because it's really interesting. So we have Anders Ritterberg and Anders Bergstrom. They decided to make it a little confusing for me, so I've got two Anders here today. So, Anders Rydberg, let's start with you, and I want to start uh, talking a little bit about this buoy project. Sure. So, can you just tell us your company and who you work for and what you do there, what your title is, and then just how did this buoy project come about? How did it, what happened, and just give us the story behind it? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I work for the Royal Danish Navy as a hydrographic surveyor, and um, well, the the background uh, for the buoy project is just a, a standard uh, hydrographic uh, survey uh, for producing nautical charts, and our vessel is equipped with the Seabat T fifty. We were just uh, sur surveying in October in. 21 and uh, came across this weird looking object uh, and well first i was just just about to delete the, the 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 dots thinking it was some sort of a, a school of fish uh, but then again uh, it, it, it did hard, did have quite a distinct distinct uh, uh, shape, so I thought, well, we will have some more passes uh, over it, and uh, sure enough, uh, all all passes uh, over it uh, reveal some some sort of object, uh, which we initially couldn't see what was or couldn't figure out what what actually was. Wow! Yeah, must have been weird. so. You initially thought it was it was a school of fish. I'm gonna bring it up here. I have an image. I want to bring up to take a look at what you were actually looking at. This image on the left-hand side is actually, I'm sure you probably saw parts of this and then you saw the whole thing, the whole entire buoy came into view. So this was something that was lost out there, I'm assuming, right? It had dropped or come loose or it had been left out there and you guys just yeah, came across yeah. it when you were using the sea bat for the hydrographic survey? Yeah, probably it was uh, a buoy from uh, from 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 German waters, which was uh, uh, drifted uh, up to the, the the southern Danish waters and and kind of sunk there. The weird thing was that it it hadn't uh, sunk as in completely sunk. It, it there was still some air trapped into it, which which was the reason why it was standing up and why we we couldn't see what it was actually because it was not something that we uh, could an anticipate that the there was a buoy standing up there. So you obviously used the uh, Teledyne Seabat extensively for the hydrographic surveys. What are some of the um, what are some of the attributes to using the Seabat? What are some of the things you find that uh, that work really well for you? Well pretty much uh, not uh, any any major uh, 
errors in 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 the in the in the in the data set. Uh, previous generations of multibeams uh, have had these uh, RAM tracks, for instance, uh, on a on a flat seabed, which on the T50 is completely gone. And so we are basically looking at a, at a very uh, clean image, uh, uh, which is uh, ex ex excellent. Um, one other feature I, I sometimes use, uh, I think we also used it in this situation, was using the, the multi-detect uh, feature uh, just to, to see if there was uh, anything other in the water uh, that we couldn't see with just one bottom algorithm. Uh, but in, in, in this case, it, it didn't show any, any significant uh, more uh, data. Right. And you primarily use the Teledyne CBAT multi-beam for your hydrographic surveys. Yeah, yeah. On almost all our vessels, we have that uh, uh, echo sound on. And you can see um, you were able to actually recover it. It's a good size buoy. I wonder what kind of buoy that that is. Were they able to determine that? Yeah, I think it was a, a starboard side a green buoy. Well, it used to be green. It 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 it, it wasn't anymore. Just some uh, small traces of uh, green paint. So do you know what kind of data it was collecting or? It was just for the purpose of safe navigation. It wasn't collecting. Oh, it's any, navigational any buoy. Yeah. 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 But didn't we report this buoy and us uh, to yeah. the uh, anti-mine warfare? Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they they took some, some divers uh, out uh, to see what it actually was and uh, they they found it uh, underwater and could confirm that it was a, a, a buoy and said that it was a it was a green buoy then uh, the mystery was solved you can say because until that mm -hmm. point uh, we had no idea what it what it what it was just some yeah vague ideas you can say uh, and then some months later when the 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 vessel got out there again. Uh, they uh, uh, caught the buoy and uh, pulled it up with a crane. Wow, the the multi beam image is really impressive. I mean, it really does look like it looks does. I mean, it looks like a buoy to me. It looks like a buoy. It, I yeah, wouldn't be able to necessarily tell what kind. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive, huh? Yeah, it has the the same shape as as the buoy you can, you can see there. It it, wow. it it was just because it was it was standing right up, we were confused about uh, what the heck it was. Right. Yeah, I can see that. Wow, that's pretty cool. All right. So um, I want to take a look at another project you guys were working on, which I think was um, really interesting. You were the the main person, Andrews Bergstrom, on this particular project. Um, so can you tell us, um, you work for the same company yes. and you um, just tell us a little bit about what you do there at that company. I think my, my role is, is the same as, as Anders, uh, hydrographic surveyor and, and mostly we do bathymetric charting. So, um, so, so for, for the next project you're going to show us here, we had the opportunity to go off a bit from the area that we were surveying in. And uh, the other surveyors on the boat, and I and myself, uh, has a history in the oil pollution response uh, department within the Royal Danish Navy. And that ship, that particular ship, uh, when it went down, did uh, leak some oil. So, so we had an interest in, in going up there and see it. And we had the time to do it. So we went off a bit and did some, some lines uh, and trying to get a a pretty picture of the this wreck that is the the largest wreck in in northern europe 225 meters wow that is big and what it is, is big, this yeah. what type of vessel is this this is a cargo uh bulk carrier and at the time it was transporting uh 
fertilizer, artificial fertilizer. So it, it's a really amazing image. Actually, I was looking at it when you were talking. It's just so it's this multi beam data now is so cool because it's so detailed. It is really detailed, and and we we tried to to. It was the bottom there, sixty meters down, and and so so we tried to test the limits of the T50 uh, while doing this and see how how much detail we can get. Uh, and the difficult part was that we wanted the propeller and we wanted the the stern of the ship, and, and to get the angle uh, to go under the ship, uh, you need to be quite a long way from the wreck while, while doing the survey. And we almost succeeded, I would say. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think you got some great images here. So you both do the hydrographic surveys, and you must, you I guess, often come across some different things, like the buoy, and you came across this shipwreck. Um, do you know any history of this shipwreck or where it came from? Yes. Uh, it happens to be like, uh, like this. When we did the survey on the ship, one of the crew members on the vessel Actually, was this? Uh, oh, he had the lookout po post uh, nearby, so he saw the accident back in 2003 when it happened. So he was the first to see the accident and reporting it to the to the authorities. So he he could show us images and and tell stories about when it went down and and all the chaos uh, surrounding it. So wow. so in in that sense, this survey got a bit personal because he was. It was like he's, he's, uh, his eyes started to tear up when he talked about this because it had so, such a big impact on, on him when it happened. So, so it, was, it, was quite, uh, it was interesting to do that. I bet. Um, now, do you have a little clip of a video that um, I do? I, have, I do have a little clip, yeah. So, so what we're seeing here is just a bit of show of video, actually, but, but it's in the iOS software that, that we're using. We can do this. So it's a bit rough, but it will give you an idea about where the wreck is and then how it's looking uh, from the data that we collected. So I'm hoping you can see this. Yeah, it looks good. So so now we're getting there to the position of the wreck and, and what we can see is that we're going to take a few flyovers and, and first we're going to see from the stern here to the bridge and what you can see is the wreck is broken in the middle. And uh, here we can see the old command bridge and some of the Equipment still being on the on the bridge. Yeah, it's pretty detailed. <laughs> it is pretty detailed, and what you see on a smokestack is that it's actually broken, and and you think the impact when when the ship went down was so hard that the the, the smokestack and the the aft deck just collapsed into itself. Now, was this based? I I don't know if you said was this based on a collision or a storm or. That was a collision, and what you can see here, if you can see my, my mouse right there, yep. that's where the actual collision happened. Wow. Got hit on the port side here and, and started taking water, and, uh, and they reported quite fast to the authorities that they were in a collision, and, and of course, the Danish authorities saw it happen. Uh, and after a few hours, they they realized that they were taking on so much water they couldn't pump it anymore, and the ship will eventually go down. So, so I think it was nine o'clock in the evening uh, uh, that the ship went down, and and all crew members, 26 uh, members on the ship, were of course uh, rescued. It was quite calm weather, and and uh, everything was going quite slowly. So, no no okay. no persons were harmed in the accident. Well, actually, when you say uh, the, that your lookout uh, contacted the authority, well, that, that was actually me because I was the authority, the uh, the officer of the watch on the nearby island of, of Bornholm. And uh, I was the one uh, who was dealing with this case to begin with. And of course, it was uh, such a big operation that uh, the 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 national uh, maritime authority was to be uh, included as well as uh, and the and the Swedish and multiple helicopters and lots of the chaos and activity. So it was quite an interesting day on the on the on the on the job. 
I bet because you guys are out there doing these surveys and then all of a sudden you start finding this stuff and, you know, especially in this case, that's a lot, you know, the buoy is one thing, but then although that had, you know, you had to get divers out there to take a look at it to see what it was and it could have been something, you know, explosive that had to be dealt with. And then, and then obviously with this, there's a lot of, uh, a lot involved as well. So it's just interesting that you guys are out there doing surveys and coming across all this, you know, shipwrecks and buoys and, and it's impressive. The seat bat, uh, multi-beam is pretty impressive. The images that it can get. This was in 60 meters and the buoy, how deep was the buoy? Uh, it was about, uh, 19 to 16 meters. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure you guys come across a lot when you're doing the surveys mapping. And it's interesting that you guys exclusively use the CBAT. It's a, obviously a good system for your purposes. It is a good system for our purpose, and it's just a pleasure to work with. So, yeah. And you collect great data. This is amazing. It's really impressive data for sure. I think with, with this particular survey we did with the ship, we tried different approaches with the sea bass. We tried beam steering and we tried narrowing and we tried different settings and, and and what we did find was that every setting did apply something else every time we did a, a line across the ship. So 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 it's it's a versatile way of doing it. I think that's one of the reasons that we, we enjoy using the the C fifty. And obviously it works well for your uh your surveys when you're mapping, yeah. Yeah. It really does, yeah. Yeah. And what are some of the what are some of the things about with the mapping that you um, find are helpful using the CBAT? I think with the T50 that the bottom algorithm is so good now that we don't necessarily need to, to clean that much anymore. So that leaves us time to, to do more work, if you can say so, uh, while doing this. So it's, it's quite nice. Yeah, we, we have, we have, a, we have a, a long history using uh, different types of the uh, of the uh, sea bats. So, uh, well, it's when it's 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 it, it's practically in in our DNA uh, using the the this uh, user interface and uh, know uh, a, a lot about the systems and 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 what the different generations have uh, have uh, brought with them uh, as uh, time has proceeded. Excellent. So this has been great. I, you know, obviously you guys are getting a lot out of your multi-beam Teledyne's multi-beam CBAT. Um, it's, the images are so amazing. The quality is obviously there. And, you know, you guys have got a long history with their technology and, you know, their technology is, you know, next to none. So um, this is some pretty impressive stuff and really cool projects. Uh, I want to thank you for being on Marine Tech Talk. I really do appreciate you taking the time and, um, in chatting with us about this. So um, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thanks for listening to the Marine Tech Talk podcast. For more information on the Teledyne Reason Seabat multi-beam sonar, please visit their website at www.teledynemarine.com. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, you can email marinetechtalk at teledyne.com. If you like this podcast, please be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcast or wherever you are listening to the show. That way you will never miss an episode. Thank you for listening, and we will see you again next time.